The Lord has commanded us to come together. That's right. In one mind, one spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're making the light shine and show all the nations that we're God's people. And hopefully we can wake up many of the nation of Islam mind to the truth of this Bible. But we have one thing in common. We're all oppressed by the same man. And we are here to show people who they are and how do we come out of this condition. Facts. IUIC, the vanguard, the leaders of this movement. We are those guys. That's right. The clock was there on your left. Correct. That's how you do it. Positive vibe. The community need this, man. It's a good look. Great look. We have to get from behind the pulpit and into the streets. This is where it's all happening at. So yeah, you're going to get a little dirty. Yeah, it's gonna be hard. But you know what? It's worth it. It's for our people. Why don't you live for the people? Why don't you struggle for the people? Why don't you die for the people? My expectations for the film is to leave with us a visual imprint on why we need to continue to make more films like what you see coming out of IUIC. Joseph's Dream was a, was was another good example. It gives it gives the visual imagery. That's very important. We we must be able to see things in our mind before we can act upon it. So what these films do, it actually puts a vision in our mind and it gives us something to step towards rather than somebody just quote unquote telling the story. Now we got visual aid that helps us in, in our tenacious drive towards the truth of the Bible. And that's good for our children as well. Shalom, sisters. Bishop Nathaniel here. You know what day it is. That's right. It is Shout Out Tuesday. It's Shout Out Tuesday. And you know how I love to read your letters of exhortation and your donations of support. But before I do that, I often love to cover a little bit of our hidden history. So sit back, relax yourself, get your libations on, get your diet food on. And let's enjoy today's quick look at some history and pay very close attention. The Jewish Encyclopedia, a descriptive record of the history, religion, literature, and customs of the Jewish people from the earliest times to the present day, prepared by more than 400 scholars and specialists. Let's go down. This is volume four, okay? Published in 1803, 1803. I always tell you, get the old books, the old books, not the new ones, but the old ones. All right, we're going 
inside, we're looking up uh, the word Kazar. Now, if you notice, they have it spelled with a C here, opposed to a K, but it's the same race, the same people, the Kazars. So let's just go inside and hold on. Let me, let me. Let's go down. All right. Among the classical writers of the Middle Ages, they were known as the Kozars, Kazirs, Akatzirs, and Akatis, and in the Russian chronicles as Qualisis and Yugri Bayalye. Don't ask me if I'm pronouncing it right. I'm probably not, but y'all can see it for yourselves. All right, let's move over. I want y'all to, I'm going to read out loud, y'all read along. In the second half of the 16th century, the Khazars moved westward. They established themselves in the territory bounded by the Sea of Azov, the Don and the Lower Volga, the Caspian Sea and the Northern Caucasus. So they lived around the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. The Caucasian Goths, <laughs> uh, Tetrax sites were subjugated by the Khazars, probably about the seventh century. Lo, uh, the, this is Russian, I don't speak Russian, sorry. I'm picking up right here with early. Early in that century, the kingdom of the Khazars had become powerful enough to enable the Cajun to send to the Byzantine emperor Heraclius an army of 40,000 men by whose aid he conquered the Persians 626 to 627. Let's move down. And let's get to some key points. In 679, the Khazars subjugated the Bulgars and extended their sway farther west between the Don and Dnieper. Now, the Bulgars are going to find out were black people. Okay. Uh, let me see if I got it in here. Mm, the reason they're going to wear it has been called the white. Um, or describing chronicles. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that another time. But today, well, I don't want to get off topic. All right, let's get back over here. Uh, as the head, you know what? Let me go back. I know I forgot the main part. In 679, the Khazars subjugated the Bulgars and extended their sway farther west between the Don and the Dnieper. As far... as the headwaters of the Donets in the province of Labelia. It was probably about that time that the Cajun, for an Cajun bullion of the Khazars, and his grandees, together with a large number of his heathen people, embraced the Jewish religion. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's go down, let's go down right here, right here. All right. Hmm. Some of the centuries, some centuries ago, King Bullen, that's Cajun Bullen, reigned over the Khazars. To him, God appeared in a dream and promised him might and glory. Encouraged by this dream, Bullen went by the road of Darlin to the country of Ardabil, where he gained great victories over the Arabs. The Byzantine emperor and the caliph of the Ishmaelites, that's the Arabs, sent to him envoys with presents and sages to convert him to their respective religion. So everybody wanted Cajun Bullen and his people on their side. Bullen invited also wise men of Israel. These men of Israel were black men. We're going to show you that. And proceeded to examine them all. As each of the champions believed his religion to be the best, Bullen separately questioned the Mohammedans and the Christians as to which of the other two religions they considered the better. When both get, when both gave preference to that of the Jews, that king perceived that it must be the true religion. He therefore adopted it. You see that? Let's go down. This account of the conversion was 
considered to be of a legendary nature. Harkavi, however, in Bilbasov and whatever that word is, <laughs> proved from Arabic and Slavonian sources that the religious disputation of the Kazarian court is a let's see, is a historical fact. Wow. Let's move over. Watch this. In this letter, Hasdi speaks of the tradition according to which the Khazars once dwelt near the Sierra Mountains. Y'all know the Sierra Mountains. Read uh, Genesis uh, 36. You read about Esau dwelling in the Sierra Mountains. Wow. Now watch this. I've been talking to y'all about Spain for a while. Remember this. Look at this. Many members of the Kazarian royal family immigrated to Spain. Until the 13th century, the Crimea was known to European travelers as Gazaria, the Italian form of Kazaria. So these Edomite converts immigrated to Spain. Okay, this was around uh, the fall when we, they conquered us in Spain, when the white man began to take it back. And these so-called white people, these converts, they some assisted us, but most assisted the white Christians. And then in 1492, they began to send us into slavery. These people joined with their Christian Caucasian brothers, which is to be expected. Atlas Geographus, or a complete system of geography, ancient and modern for Africa. Uh, this is volume four, printed in 1714. Let's go over to page 39. Now I have this book in another format, but it's, the print is so small. Uh, remember, these are reprints. Leo says there are other kingdoms on the southern frontier of this country, talking about Africa, which are inhabited by a rich, industrious, and just sort of people. Judaism was the religion of the ancient Africans for a long time and succeeded by Christianity. But Mohammedanism, Islam, prevailed in the 208th year of the Hegira, when all the Jews, Christians, and professors of the African religion that could be found were put to death. Yet in process of time, their intestine quarrels made them neglect Muhammad's law and revolt from the Caliph of Baghdad, for which they were severely punished by the Mohammedan Caliphs, who caused all their books to be burnt on suspicion that the knowledge of the arts and sciences prompted them to contemn Muhammad's law. Y'all see that? Let's go down to the next highlighted section. Those of Upper Ethiopia worshipped the Lord of Heaven before the Queen of Sheba went to Solomon to be instructed in the law of Moses and the prophets when they embraced Judaism, as did also some of the inhabitants of Lower Ethiopia, who continued in it till they were taught Christianity by the queen of Candace's eunuch, who was baptized by Philip. Okay, let's go over to the side. Some of the Jews who inhabit both sides of the Niger derived themselves from Abraham. Others fled hither from Asia when Vespasian destroyed Jerusalem or from Judea when it was when when it was wa wasted when it was wasted by the romans persians saracens and christians some were banished from italy in 1342 from spain in 1462 from the low countries that's the netherlands in 1350 from france in 1403 and from england in 1422 these all defer, inhabit, and are divided into several wealthy and numerous tribes, but have no dominion, are despised of all nations, 
uh, and so abominated by the Turks that they are not permitted to be Mohammedans unless first baptized and then made use of only to receive their customs and gather in their taxes. Wow. There are so, this is page 292. There are so many Jews here who serve as mercenary soldiers and are called by the other Jews in Africa, Carson, i.e. scripturemen, for they reject traditions. You see that? They are so fond of their own black complexion and so much abhor a white one. It says, they are, so far, they are so fond of their own black complexion and so much abhor a white one that in contempt, they paint the devil white. He observes that they have tried all religions and agree in none. This said, they were first idolaters, then Jews, then Christian. Africa being an accurate description of the regions of Egypt, Barbary, Libya, and Bildegurid, the land of Negroes, Guinea, Ethiopia, and the Abyssinians. Abyssinia, that's Ethiopia. All right. This was published in 1670, 1670. Africa being an accurate description of the regions of Egypt, Barbary, Libya, and Bill Delgarid, the land of Negroes, Guinea, Ethiopia, and the Abyssinians, that's Ethiopia, published in 1670, 1670, let's go in. I'm on page 34. That's the original page, but in this book, it's on 31. All right, I'm gonna start here. Many Jews also are scattered over this region. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed. It's talking about Africa. I'm gonna see the title there, Africa. Many Jews also are scattered over this region. What region? Africa. Some natives boasting themselves of Abraham's seed, inhabiting both, si inhabiting both sides the river Niger, or nigger. Others, uh, others are Asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian at 70 AD, or from Judea, wasted and depopulated by the Romans, Persians, Saracens, as Muslims, and Christians, or else such as came out of Europe, whence they were banished. So I'm referring to those Jews, those black Jews that were banished, those Jews that were keeping the commandments that were banished. Not all the all the blacks, but the ones keeping the commandments. Out of some, they were banished where from where? Out of some parts of Italy, in the year 1342, out of Spain, in the year 1462, out of the Low Countries, that's the Netherlands, in 1350, out of France in 1403, out of England in 1422. These all defer in habit and are divided into several tribes, having no dominion, though both wealthy and numerous, but despised of all nations, and so abominated by the Turks that they are not admitted to be Mohammedans unless first baptized, and then, no other, and then no otherwise made use of than to receive their customs and gather in their taxes.
All right. Here, you see Spain there. All right, I want you to look at the borders of Africa. There's Arabia. Let me just come in closer. All right, there's Somaliland. This is the Horn of Africa. Ethiopia, called Abyssinia at this time. I want you to notice where they got the Jews located at. There's the Falashas there. Look over here, Yemen Jews. That's in Arabia. But I want to focus on Africa. All right. Tababan Jews. A pre-exilic Yahwism. That's for those that followed Yahweh. All right. Let's move over. Let's move over. I'm going to go down to the bottom. Look. Loando Jews, this is on the coast of Africa, all right? Mavumbu Jews, look, this is what I was just showing you in the other books. San Tome Jews, remember the Israelites was, the Jews were cast out of Spain and sent to San Tome or St. Thomas. That's that island right there. All right, look, Levite cities, where amongst the houses, you know, a lot of you Nigerians, you hate the houses. There's Cameroons, Levite cities over here. This is Nigeria, Nigeria, N-I-G-E-R-I-A, Nigeria. You got Levite cities there. Houses, Levite cities, Levite cities. Beni Ephraim, sons of Ephraim. Beni means, or Benai means sons of Ephraim. Okay, the Homi, the Homi Jews, Jewish traces all amongst the Ashanti, Judeo paganism. So these Israelites here were following pagan customs around Cape Verde and Senegambia. The Lam Lam, once a Jewish colony, Timbuktu. Let's go around here. Medieval Jewish Kingdom, Jewish Kingdom of Ganada. Let me go down, let me find some of these words, let me look. Mm. Let me go up along the coast, I'm gonna follow the coastline. Beni Musa, son of Mo sons of Moses. Now, it's hard for me to see. Y'all know I wear glasses, but if y'all at home, y'all could spot some of this stuff before I do. Berber Jews. Berber Jews. Black Jews. And I want y'all to see this because this is what the so-called scholars put together. The Jews were cast out of Spain. Remember that history I've been showing y'all for a while. My eyesight ain't that good, but I'm just showing y'all this map. So if y'all see something, y'all can freeze screen it. Freeze the screen. <laughs> Israel immigrates here. Look at that. To Arabia. That's Arabia right there. Jewish traces. What's that say? Wasambara. Yemen Jews and Falashas, Berber, Moorish, and Negro Jews. So the white man knows the blacks are the Israelites. They know that. They keep this stuff hidden from us. This video on the role of Christianity in the slave trade, with a special focus on the Catholic Church. Sometimes it's important to dive into the uncomfortable and difficult parts of history, even if it makes us squirm a little. And boy, does this topic have some uncomfortable parts. We all know that slavery is one of the darkest chapters in human history. But what many people don't realize is the significant role that religion played in justifying and perpetuating the practice. And when it comes to Christianity and the slave trade, 
the Catholic Church was right in the thick of it. From Pope Nicholas V's 1452 papal bull that authorized the Portuguese to enslave Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, to the Jesuit priests who owned slaves themselves, there's a lot to unpack here. But fear not, my dear viewers, we'll take a look at the history, theology, and the human impact of Christianity's involvement in the slave trade. The slave trade involved the transportation and sale of African people as slaves to the Americas and other parts of the world from the 16th to the 19th century. It was a brutal and dehumanizing practice that involved capturing and enslaving people against their will, separating them from their families and loved ones, and forcing them to work under inhumane conditions. The origins of the slave trade can be traced back to the European exploration and colonization of Africa in the 15th century. Europeans wanted to establish colonies in the Americas, and they needed a cheap labor source to work on their plantations and mines. They turned to Africa, where they found a ready supply of potential slaves. Africans were captured by slave traders, who would raid villages and take people by force. They were then transported across the Atlantic Ocean in brutal conditions, packed tightly into the holds of slave ships with little food or water. Many died on the journey, and those who survived were often sick and weak by the time they reached their destination. Once they arrived in the Americas, slaves were sold at auctions to the highest bidder. They were forced to work on plantations, mines, and in households, and were treated as property rather than human beings. They had no rights and were subject to brutal punishment if they disobeyed their masters. The slave trade had a devastating impact on Africa as it disrupted traditional societies and economies. Many African communities were weakened by the loss of their people, and some were destroyed entirely. The Catholic Church was heavily involved in the slave trade as it was seen as a way to spread Christianity to Africa and the Americas. Christianity played a significant role in the transatlantic slave trade, with many Christian leaders and institutions supporting and profiting from the practice. This fact is often overlooked, as many people associate Christianity with benevolence and goodwill. However, the reality is that many Christian leaders and institutions were complicit in the slave trade, and it is important to understand their role in this dark chapter of history. One of the most notable Christian institutions involved in the slave trade was the Catholic Church and many Catholic leaders continued to own slaves and profit from the trade. The church also played a role in justifying the slave trade, with some church leaders arguing that it was a necessary evil to bring Christianity to Africa. The role of the Catholic Church in the transatlantic slave trade is a complex and controversial topic. The Catholic Church was one of the most powerful institutions in the world during the era of the slave trade, and its involvement in this system of human trafficking has been the subject of much debate and scrutiny. While some argue that the Catholic Church was complicit in the slave trade, one of the most significant roles the Catholic Church played in the slave trade was its involvement in the colonization of the Americas. The Church played a significant role in the Spanish and Portuguese colonization of the Americas, which led to the forced labor of millions of indigenous peoples and Africans. The Church played a key role in the justification of these practices, using religious doctrine to argue that the enslavement of non-Christian peoples was justified. For example, in 1452, Pope Nicholas V issued the papal bull Dum Diversus, which gave the Portuguese monarchy the right to enslave non-Christians. Furthermore, the Catholic Church was involved in the sale and ownership of slaves. Many of the wealthiest and most powerful individuals in Europe and the Americas during the era of the slave trade were Catholic, and many of them owned slaves. The Church itself also owned slaves, with some religious orders, such as the Jesuits, owning plantations and using slave labor. The Church also profited from the slave trade, as it collected taxes on the sale of slaves in its territories and used the proceeds to fund its activities. However, it is important to note that the Church's involvement in the slave trade and slavery had a lasting impact on the people affected by it. The legacy of slavery can still be seen today, with many people of African descent facing discrimination and inequality. Protestantism was also complicit in the slave trade. Protestantism was also complicit in the slave trade. Protestantism was also complicit in the slave trade, with many Protestant leaders owning slaves and investing in the trade with many Protestant leaders owning slaves and investing in the trade. 
Some Protestant leaders even used the Bible to justify slavery, pointing to passages that seemed to condone the practice. However, the fact remains that Christianity was often used to justify and support the slave trade. One of the most interesting aspects of the relationship between Christianity and the slave trade is the role that religion played in the lives of enslaved people. Many enslaved Africans were forced to convert to Christianity. Many enslaved Africans were forced to convert to Christianity. Many enslaved Africans were forced to convert to Christianity, often by their captors or by missionaries who believed that Christianity could civilize them. However, many enslaved Africans also found solace and hope in Christianity, even as they were oppressed by their Christian captors. It is worth noting that the relationship between Christianity and the slave trade was complex, and there were many different perspectives on the practice within the Christian community. However, it is clear that Christianity played a significant role in the transatlantic slave trade, and it is important to acknowledge and understand this history. Of course, all of this raises some interesting questions. If Christianity was used to justify and support the slave trade, does that mean that Christianity is inherently oppressive? Does it mean that all Christians are complicit in the slave trade? The truth is, the legacy of the slave trade is still being felt today, centuries after the last slave ship set sail. Slavery was abolished in the 19th century, but its impact of it is still being felt across the globe. Let's take a look at some of the lasting effects of the slave trade. First and foremost, the slave trade created a massive wealth gap between Western nations and African nations. The slave trade was a huge source of revenue for countries like Britain, France, and Spain, and the wealth generated from it was used to fund the Industrial Revolution. Meanwhile, African nations were stripped of their resources and their people, leaving them impoverished and underdeveloped. To this day, many African nations are still struggling to catch up to the rest of the world in terms of economic development. The legacy of the slave trade is also evident in the racial inequalities that still exist in many parts of the world. The idea of white supremacy, which was used to justify the slave trade, is still present in many societies today. It's hard to deny that race plays a role in things like hiring decisions, police brutality, and the criminal justice system. These issues are deeply ingrained in our societies, and it will take a lot of work to undo the damage that has been done. One of the most insidious legacies of the slave trade is the notion of whiteness itself. The idea of a white race is a relatively recent invention, and it was created in large part to justify the subjugation of non-white peoples. The idea that there are inherent differences between races, and that some are superior to others, has been used to justify everything from slavery, to colonialism, to genocide. All right, you saw it for yourself, you saw it for yourself. Now that was some good stuff, if I do say so myself. And I do. Now today we're going to talk about the great debate and historic look at Satan. That's right, I said a great debate and historic look at Satan. What am I talking about? You're going to find out. We're going to look at it together. All right, let me just cue this up for you. Just wait a minute. Be patient with me. All righty, all righty. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And I'm speaking directly to you, Rabbi Shmuley. I don't... Shmuley! Shmuley, 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 Shmuley. Let's go back again. This is Candace Owens. Many of you saw it. Whoever didn't, well, today's going to be a treat for you. This fake rabbi named Shmuley has been harassing and condemning Candace Owens for a long time. Now, I don't agree with everything Candace Owens says, but this right here, this right here, I agree with her. Why? Because she's, quo she's quoting scripture. That's right. She's quoting God's word. And that is what I agree on. That's what I stand 10 toes down on. So let's watch it. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And I'm speaking directly to you, Rabbi Shmuley. I don't... Wait, wait. What do you mean it's true? Because she said it's true? To, to say wait, wait, wait. It ain't true because Candace says it's true. It's true because God says it's true. That's why it's true. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Let's go on. I would like to, to say to you, Rabbi, since you're, you're quoting scripture, okay, the one that's relevant to me is woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. And if you'd like to 
d- dive into a little more scripture, I think what's relevant is Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. And I'm speaking directly to you, Rabbi Shmuley, the fact that you would try to say, you, I am you, Jewish, Daniel. and this is what I believe, and, and do and say the things that you are doing. People can see and hear evil, and what you are doing right now is an act of evil. The lies that you are the telling. Not- I got to pause it right there. She told his behind up she tore the devil up now let's let's go back to the scriptures she done quoted there because you got to see it for yourself now i'm glad she quoted uh revelation 3 9 opposed to revelation 2 9 i'm gonna tell you why revelation 2 9 what christians like to do is say oh that was in the past that just pertained to the church of smyrna that's something that already occurred although we know it's going to occur again. But Revelation 3, 9, let's read it together. Behold, this is what Jesus is saying. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Now, did that happen already? Did that happen yet? The answer is no. This is a prophecy. Can you, let's hear it again. Prophecy. There's a prophecy. So this has not occurred yet and it will occur. So that means in this day and time, who's the ones running throughout the earth saying that they're the Jews? These white folks like Shmoolies, these Shmoolies, these people say that they're Jews. So that pertains to them. So when is this going? When is going to, when's the fulfillment of this? Hold on, let me look at a scripture. Hold on, y'all bear with me. Go, come with me, Isaiah 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Mm-hmm. And we're going to look at verse 14 as a precept. Isaiah 60 and 14 reads, The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despised thee, that means hated thee, shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Y'all see that right there? Prophecy. That's what Revelation 3, 9 is making reference to. Let me get another one. Uh, Isaiah 49. Let me look at it. Let me look at it. Let me look at it. Isaiah 49, 23. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens, thy nursing mothers, they shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Whoa! Shmuley! What you got to say now, Shmuley? Hey, all you Christians out there, and some of you weak, effeminate Israelites, who were just so scared, oh, 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 this ain't for you. You don't believe in God, you don't believe in the scriptures at all. We give you these scriptures right here and you're just so offended. Christ said, blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me, in Matthew eleven and six. But now, what else did Candace quote? Oh, Isaiah five and 20, she quoted that one. Isaiah five and 20, let's just take a look at it. Isaiah, y'all bear with me. I'm kind of slow. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Candace Owens quoted this one too. Woe unto them that call evil good. See, the fact that these white folks can lie, call themselves the Jews, and they call that evil good. The fact that they can blow up Gaza and say and call themselves settlers. Now, the, the terminology they use as a settler, let's break down settler. They say one that settles. No. When white people say they're settling, they mean they are coming to steal, kill, and destroy. That's a settler in white folks. When you look at white folks, they say, oh, I'm coming to... When they came and settled North America, what did they do? They stole a continent. They robbed, killed, destroyed. That's what they did. That's what they did. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. We speak the words of God and we'll say, we're the Jews. They say, that's evil. 
That's anti-Semitism. Evil. We'll say Jesus is black and they'll say, that's evil. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now let's go on now. Let's go on now. Watch this. Oh, how can I forget this? Psalms 94. To you weak Christians out there, I'm talking to you men. Candace Owens got more balls, more cojones than you Christian men, than some of you Israelite men. Some of you Israelite men got Edomites sitting around you. And you know they Edomites, and they know they Edomites. They ain't even trying to fake it and say they're dead or rude. No, no, no. They're telling you, we're from Poland. We're from Czechoslovakia. We are Esau, Edom. And you go, well, the kingdom's for you too. No, it ain't. They're around with you. So God says this in Psalms 94. Psalms 94, verse 16. Who will rise up for me? against the evildoers, or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? It sure ain't you Christian apologetics. It sure ain't you effeminate Israelite men out there walking around. Yeah, you know who you are. You know who you are. Some of you weak as hell. Weak, weak, weak. Right. Here you go. That's not in the New Testament. Yes, it is. I'm going to 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination. Now, white folks might imagine they are the Jews. Our job is to cast that imagination down. White folks might imagine Jesus is white. Our job is to cast that down. White folks might imagine they can rob, steal, kill today and get the kingdom of heaven tomorrow and receive no judgment, our job is to cast that imagination down. So verse five again, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, we're gonna take a look at Dr. What's his name, Stephen, Dr. Stephen Pigeon. He's a political scientist, with a doctorate in philosophy and an active attorney with a Juris Doctorate in the state of Washington. Now, he brings out a lot of good stuff. I'm not saying I agree with everything he says, and what I agree with, I'm going, I'm going to pause and tell you I agree with it. Okay, so again, he's, yes, he's Esau Edom, and he may not even know he Esau Edom, but he is, as far as I'm concerned. Now, let's take a look at what he got to say about the synagogue of Satan. Just Talmud was dead. The Torah was dead and the Talmud was living. The Talmud was controlling. The Torah was gone, the Talmud's controlling. And then John Hyrcanus converts everybody into this, most of the Edomites, into this mm -hmm. religion, point of the sword, forced circumcision. Now yeah. there were some Levites and there were some of that. So he's given a history on how during the time of the Maccabees, uh, John Hycranus, which was one of the sons of uh, one of the Maccabees, had for forcibly converted Edomites that were in the land of Edom, also called Idumia, during that time. He forced them to get circumcised. So this is the brief history he's going over. The house of Yahuda is still present in the land but they were very few and far between. I mean, they represented maybe 5% of the population in this kingdom of Edomea. And so this brings up the religion of Judaism. Yeah. Now, this religion, when, when Mashiach sees this religion, he knows this is happening. These guys have now reconstructed a temple. They're claiming the name is there. They're trying to practice the doctrines that were set. He's referring to Herod. Remember, Herod had reconstructed the temple. Once Israel rebuilt it during the time of the Persian captivity under Zerubbabel, Joshua, Ezra, Nehemiah, y'all can read those books on your own, uh, Zechariah, you can read about the Haggai. Uh, when Herod and Idumean and Edomite came in power, he reconstructed it, meaning he added to it, he built it, made it look fortified, beautiful, beautiful, 
okay? So this is the history, and Herod was an Edomite, Caucasian man, so-called Jewish. Fourth in the kingdom of Yahud under David, and so Mashiach comes to them to square them away. Okay, guys, look, you know, you, you got this wrong, right? Your, your Talmud is wrong here. Your Talmud is wrong there. You know, you're really a den of vipers. You, you've heaped up a bunch of burdens on men's shoulders that don't belong there. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Why the Talmud is a book of traditions. Although the Pharisees uh, did at times teach or quote God's laws, most of what they taught was based on the Talmud, which is the traditions of men. You can read about that in Matthew 15, one down. Christ was getting on them. Let me give you an example. I got to read it so you know what reference point I'm speaking of. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Because they were following traditions. They were following Talmud, the Talmud. And this is what uh, Dr. Stephen Pigeon is making reference to. All right, let's go on. You're following that, you know, and then to prove that I have authority. He spoke with authority. What's to say? Very first off, he spoke in the synagogue. He spoke with authority. And they were all mind boggled. like, you don't speak like the scribes. You speak right. like with authority. Because he had the authority. And then he shows the authority through the miracles and through the healings and through the raising of the dead. All of these things, he's proving his authority. And he's trying to clarify to them, if you're going to pull these scriptures out, you need to find the truth of it. It's this way and not that way. It's lawful to do good on the Shabbat. It's lawful to heal, heal on the Shabbat. It's lawful to eat the showbread on Shabbat. It, because the Shabbat was created for man, not man for the Shabbat. But nonetheless, his practice was the Shabbat. Nonetheless, his practice was the feast. I mean, there'd be no last. So the Shabbat is how they pronounce it in Hebrew, the Sabbath. All right. And that's for those of you that's like, what is he talking about? Let's go on. Supper if he wasn't practicing the Pesach. Right. Pesach is Hebrew for Passover. Let me go back just a few seconds because I'm talking. I don't want to break the thought. Do good on the Shabbat. It's lawful to heal, heal on the Shabbat. It's lawful to eat the showbread on Shabbat. It because the Shabbat was created for man, not man for the Shabbat. But nonetheless, his practice was the Shabbat. Nonetheless, his practice was the feast. I mean, there'd be no Last Supper if he wasn't practicing the Pesach. Right. Right. There would right. be no foundation of the whole of the community of the faith if there hadn't been the Ruach coming to them on Shavuot. Right. That's you know, these, these feasts are for us. Yeah. These feasts are for us. These feasts are for us. Now, he's including himself like it's for him, but these feasts are for the Israelites. That's what Christ was saying. Now, he mentioned a few. He mentioned Shabbat. Um, you can read about that in Matthew 12 and 8. Christ said he's Lord of the Sabbath, Genesis 2 and 1. That's when the Sabbath was first introduced. Exodus 31, I want to read that one because Christians tend not to want to read this one. Ah, Exodus 31, watch this, verse 16 and 17. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath <laughs> to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It, meaning the Sabbath, is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For how long? forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the Sabbath was made from the time of Adam. It was given to the Israelites to keep forever as a sign. Now, Passover. Christ observed that in Matthew 26, verse 19. As a matter of fact, let me get it. And the reason I'm reading these, because uh, there's six uh, high holy days that, is, that Christ observed that you can read about. He observed all of them, but it's mentioned particularly there's six. Now, if there's any more, y'all can add it in the comments, all right? So we read um, uh, Exodus 31, 16, which is Matthew 12 and 8, which says the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Now I'm dealing with the, the Passover, Matthew 26, verse 19. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, 
and they made ready the Passover. So Christ kept the Passover, which you can read about Leviticus 23, verse 5. The next high holy day that Christ kept, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. You can read about that. Let's go to John chapter 7. Watch this, John chapter 7 and verse 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So in John 7, you read about them observing the Feast of Tabernacles based on Leviticus 23, verse 34. The next high holy day Christ kept, come John, he said these are the feasts. So what feasts? John 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. What, what's the feast of dedication? In Hebrew, they call it Hanukkah. You can read about that in 1 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 56. So these are holidays Christ kept. The next one was, you can read about in the New Testament, Acts 2 and 1. Acts 2, verse 1, the disciples were observing this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. What is the feast? What is the day of Pentecost? That is the feast of weeks. You can read about that in Leviticus 23, verse 16. The next one, Acts 27 and verse 9. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them. When you look up there in many Bibles, it'll say the fast was on the 10th day of the seventh month. Leviticus 23, verse 7. So I'm showing you these holidays that were observed in the New Testament that none of you Christians keep, that you celebrate false holidays like Christmas and, 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 and New Year's Eve and Mother's Day and something with a bunny rabbit. You bunch of liars. But let's go on, let's go on, let's go on. They're, they're not for, for the religion of Judaism. They're for us. You know, and so at any rate, so this is what you see. So now when you talk about the three elements of who is Yahuda, you could be it racially, you could be it citizenship wise, but you can't because the kingdom was destroyed in 586 BC and never recreated. Notice it said you, he said you can be it racially. Mm. He said in citizenship, but he said you cannot because it was destroyed. The land was destroyed or religiously. So you're either that genetically or you're what they call in, in the modern Jews, a, a practitioner of the religion. So the practitioner of the religion is really the defining point. Now, was there a, a racial centered group that was practicing this religion? Yeah, there was. And these, believe it or not, these people sprung out of the, the they have now been identified uh, through DNA as Greco-Roman, not Turkish, but Greco-Roman. Well, when you so he's speaking about white folks. Greco-Roman is white folk. He said they're not Turkish. Sometimes some books say Turkish origin, but he's letting you know this part I agree with Greco-Roman, white people. Come to and, and you can see this in the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Jewish Encyclopedia I says got that. that the Ashkenazi are children of Esau. Woo! Okay. Yep. So when you when you look at the when you look at what happened and Jasher gives us this story, nobody wants oh, oh Jasher sucks. No nope. now I've skimmed through the book of Jasher. I don't tell y'all to go into it because uh in the Bible, the books of the Apocrypha were there, and it was in the King James original text. It did not include the book of Jasher or Enoch. Uh the Latin Vulgate also included the books of the Apocrypha. Uh, it did not include Enoch or Jasher. Uh, what else? The Greek Septuagint. Uh, it had the books of the Apocrypha also. It did not include Jasher or Enoch. Okay. So, however, he has looked through it, and he's going to make some references to it. Let's go on. We should ever read Jasher. We hate Jasher. It's not a it's not a bona fide document. It's blah 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 blah. But Jasher is the only one that gives us the story, and says Zepho, Zepho, who Zepho. That was the son, the grandson of Esau. Let's go to Genesis thirty six. 
Genesis 36. Uh, let me see what verse it is. Genesis 36 uh, and verse. Let me look. Let me look. Let me look. Let me look. Uh, I'll start at 10. These are the names of of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Bashemath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were, now these are the grandkids, uh, and the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, that's who he's making reference to, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kenaz, okay? So y'all see that Zepho, that's who he's making reference to it. Now the book of uh, Jasher makes mention of Zepho. So let's go back just a few seconds. I don't want to break the thought. So when you when you look at the when you look at what happened, and Jasher gives us this story. Nobody wants oh, oh Jasher sucks. Nobody should ever read Jasher. We hate Jasher. It's not a it's not a bona fide document. It's blah 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 blah. But Jasher is the only one that gives us the story and says, Zepho. Zepho. Who's Zepho? He was the grandson of Esau, taken captive and taken back into not the Mitzrayim, but the Cushite Empire. He's taken into the Cushite. Well, he's taken into Mitzrayim as a prisoner. He escapes and gets into the Cushite Empire, and he spends all his time in the Cushite Empire trying to talk to him and to make him war on the guys who took him captive. Let's go up there and, and bust their heads, right? And they're like, you know, we want to do that, but, they, you know, their army's a lot bigger than ours. We're not going. We're not going. So what does he do? He goes to it, Italy. He goes to Italy, and he makes all these promises and becomes the king of the Kittim. Uh, Kittim was the ancient name of Italy. You'll see the word Kittim. They pronounce it. Kittim is referring to Italy in the Bible. He becomes the king of the Kittim at the same time that Zarak and Peretz are forming Rome. Zepho is becoming the king of the Kittim. Now, as he becomes the king, now, and, and by the way, you might say, oh, it's not possible that Peretz and Zarak were these Romulus and Remus. Then you explain to me the Etruscan alphabet, which wow. is Paleo Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. It's Paleo Hebrew. As is the Colburn alphabet, Paleo Hebrew. Explain to me those two alphabets. What are they doing there? If Sirach and Peretz were not the founders, right? And so here you see a child of Esau, a grandson of Esau, the first king of Rome, and the 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 kingdom of Edomia would understand that they were going to make war with the Kittim until they recognized that their king was an Edomite. Ah, uh, we don't need to do that. And what's the next thing you see? You see this unity between the Romans and the Edomites. You had Julius Caesar, he was an Edomite. Augustus Caesar were Edomites. Now he's going, he's trying to say that even before that, under, he said Romulus and Remus were Heretz and Peretz and that they were Edomites. But that's neither here nor there. That's not the point we want to get to in this discussion. In this discussion, all the Romans later on became, were Edomites, all of them, okay? And that's why in the book of Maccabees, you will read about Rome, the Greeks, and uh, Edom. Let's go on. So when, when Antiochus of Epiphanes comes in, and he comes out, oh, you know, I've had it with these guys, man, these Maccabees that are going to do this rebellion and establish this new chosen people kingdom. I've had it with this stuff. I'm going to stomp them. And he goes down to Egypt, and it, who is it meets him? A Roman meets him. And he draws a line in the sand. He says, if you're going to take on these Edomites, here's the line right here. If you cross that line, then we know that's what you're going to do. And the implication is then Rome's going to come at war with you. Okay. That's where drawing a line in the sand initially stems from. That story wow. with Antiochus Epiphanes. So Antiochus flees, he leaves, and he goes back, and he ultimately dies from syphilis, and he loses <laughs> the kingdom. He loses the Maccabean kingdom, the Hasmonean kingdom. Right. You can read that in um let me look. Is it first Maccabees nine? Let me look. Or is it second? Let me look. Let me look. Uh da, da, da. second Maccabees. Second Maccabees chapter nine. And when you read verse nine down, talks about the death of 
Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes, all right? Well, this is actually an Edomite kingdom that becomes controlled by Edomites under Herod. So when you get to the Herodian kingdom, that's an Edomite kingdom. Did you hear what he said? When you get to the Herodian kingdom, Rome, that's an Edomite kingdom. We've been telling you brothers and sisters that for a long, years, years, just pay attention. And it's, and it's good that the, that the white man is telling you because when your brother tells you, oh no, yeah, uh, 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 uh. let's go on. It's mm -hmm. Edomia all over again, okay? And so this house of Esau is now controlling Rome. It's controlling its leaders. <clears throat> and the Caesars, <clears throat> who had declared themselves Pontiff Maximus, were children of Esau. Did you hear that? The Caesars were all children of Esau. Woo! See? Oh, man. This is some good stuff right here. Esau. Yeah. Okay, Esau. Now, this is going to become much more difficult when we get into farther into this. But <laughs> this group of people were the ones who eventually migrated into Central Europe and then eventually migrated. Wait. They migrated into Central Europe. Let's take a, map, a look at the map of Central Europe. Y'all bear with me a second. If I could just find it and pull it up. Where is it? Bear with me. I'm going to get it in a second. I just got to take a look at it. Okay, here we go. Central Europe. Take a look at Central Europe. That includes Germany, Poland, Czech Republic, Austria, Slovakia, Hungary, Switzerland. Do y'all see that? That's called Central Europe. Let's go back a few seconds. I'm going back a few seconds. Pontiff Maximus were children of Esau. Esau. Yeah. Okay, Esau. Now, this is going to become much more difficult when we get into farther into this. But this group of people were the ones who eventually migrated into Central Europe and then eventually migrated into this area of Khazar because this area of Khazar is one of the most fertile places on earth. I mean, you know, particularly when you're talking about like the Khazarian Empire occupied all the way to the Caspian Sea. All the way to the Caspian Sea, that's in Russia. That's the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia, Russia. So that includes Ukraine, Russia, that whole region up there. They're all Edomites. That's what this Edomite is revealing to another Edomite. These conversations ain't with you black folks. This conversation ain't with you. You sit in your little um, theology schools and learn nothing. You learn nothing. But this guy, he's coming with some truth. That means, you know, what is now modern Krasnodar and Cherkessia and all of this. This is, we, we like we used to do mission work over there, what was called the Black Soil Project, because it is so fertile over wow. in that area. It's unbelievable. And so they had occupied this area all the way to what we now call Odessa and all the way back to what we now call, uh, um, well, the capital city was Attil, and that is now the province of Dagestan in southern Russia. And uh, the, the capital city there is now called Astrakhan, which used to be called Attil, you know, from Attila the Hun, you know, he came right. out of there, Attil. Yeah, so that was, and that's now, called, they changed it to Astrakhan when Genghis Khan captured the whole area. Okay, so the Russians would pull that area away from the Mongols. They defeated right. the Mongols, right? That's the first step, but that became, when Russia became, uh, you know, imperious to, uh, 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 to uh, defeat on the battlefield when they defeated the Mongols, right? Yeah. And uh, so anyway, so you have this idea that they were in this fertile area. Well, the problem was these guys were notorious because they were identity thieves, they were pirates, uh, and... Wait, he says these people were identity thieves. Let's listen to him go a little more into that. I'm, hmm, pay close attention. By deception, they waged war. So they would mm -hmm. take on the names of somebody and take on their identity. Wait, wait, does the Bible talk about that? Let's go to Micah chapter two. Micah two and two. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it. 
because it is in the power of their hand. Meaning this people would have power, military power. And they covered fields and take them by violence. It doesn't say voting. They took them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. What does that mean? Not only does he take your land, your house and all, he takes your identity. Okay, like in South Africa, what did they, they stole the land. Now they say, we are South Africans. We are South Africans. They took the place of Australia. They said, now we, we are Australians. As they murdered all the people there, even here in North America. They said, oh, we are Americans. We, we are the ones. Manifest destiny. Are you kidding me? That's what they do. Once they conquer and steal, rob, destroy, they take on that new identity. Listen, this is what he's saying. They would take on the names of somebody and take on their identity and then claim to be royalty or nobility or whatever. They were engaged in identity theft right from the get-go. Once they stole Israel, they said, oh, I'm the lineage of King David. I'm the lineage of Aaron, the high priest. That's what they do. Y'all don't see this in the news. I'm a Kohen. What's a Kohen? I'm a priest. How can you? When they conquer, steal, they take the identity. That's what they do. Let's go on. Well, the Kievan Rus would get ticked off at him. The Kievan Rus finally said, look, you guys, we're not going to do, do this anymore. You know, we're an, we're an Orthodox people and you need to be, you need to settle down on what you're going to do. So they declared Judaism to be their religion. So they declared Judaism to be their religion. Right. Now, when they did, when, when this was around the 8th century, they declared Judaism to be religion. Why? Because they were, again, it was the same idea of the Maccabean approach, right? Edomites that had become, had, be, had gone into this religion of Judaism it went around 165, 150 BC. That would be transferred in Rome. That's why the popes were keepers, mm -hmm. right? And a keeper is a yarmulke. A kippa is a yarmulke. Now you know why the pope, fake pope, wears a kippa or a yarmulke. They are the same people. Oh, but he's from Argentina. Hell with that. These are the same people. Judeo Christianity is the same garbage. That's what this dude, Dr. Stephen Pigeon, is re revealing. Pay attention. Let me calm down. Let's go. And, and then that would ultimately be transferred into Khazaria. And in the Khazaria, they would bring in this Babylonian Talmud. And so the Talmud is going to continue to be increased with even more wickedness. It's going to be increased with even more wickedness. The writing of Maimonides includes its own share of wickedness. And then you would have, then of course, you would, you would see guys like Sabati Sfi and the Kabbalists that would begin to arise in the 1400s after the expulsion from Spain. In particular, they began to rise in Safet. The expulsion from Spain, we've gone over that. That was the black Jews being scattered throughout Africa. Cape Verde, all along the coast, okay? Now, there were Ashkenazis there. I'm not denying that. And you had some white people that claimed to be Sephardim that were there. Many of them joined with Spain and became part of the conquistador army, a lot of them, okay? Those that did not want to conform, they fled. They were allowed to leave. We got caught, captured, and enslaved. Okay, but he doesn't talk about that in this one. And in Istanbul or Constantinople, and mm -hmm. this, all of this language would get transferred into the Talmud. And so then when you get to the 1200s, Shem Tov, mm -hmm. they began to develop rabbinical Judaism. Okay. Now, under rabbinical Judaism, it is not a question of believing in Yah. It is not a question of believing in the Torah. It is obeying the rabbi. So Yah is the Hebrew name. That's an abbreviation for Yahweh. Yah is a, an abbreviation for Yahweh. Uh, the Torah is Hebrew for law, which is the first five books of Moses. But he's saying that based on the Talmud, it's more important to obey the rabbis than it is uh, to obey what God says in his word. Let me show you about this, this rabbi thing. Because you keep, you keep hearing that you had that fake rabbi, Shmuley Muli. Uh, and he's not, none of them are rabbis, none of these people. Matthew 23, 
And verse 8. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So the terminology rabbi is Hebrew for master. Christ said, don't call any man your master. Understand that? Let's go on now. You might remember Fiddler on the Roof when Rev Kevius says, well, it's written in the good book. Well, what does the rabbi have to say about it? Well, the good book says, and he didn't know what the good book said, right? No. There must be something in the good book about the chicken, right? <laughs> he, right? He didn't know what was said in the good book, and he relied on the rabbi to tell him what, the, what was in the good book. And the rabbi would spend all his time penciling what? The Talmud, right? So right. the rabbis were teaching them, you know, you can divorce your wife if she burns the toast, mm. you know. <laughs> Right. This is the kind of stuff that they're finding in the Talmud, right? And there's even a reference to that in Fiddler on the Roof. There's references to pedophilia in the Talmud as well, meaning justification of it. And yeah. what does what does Rev Tebia say? We do these things because they're tradition. 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 Right? And so it's all about the tradition, and it's about the rabbinical authority governing the tradition. It is not about the worship of Yah. Has nothing to do with that. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, right? Uh, bingo. I mean, that's it. So you can see, for instance, many modern Jews, self-professed atheists. Now, this is Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl uh, was a proclaimed atheist. And what he did was uh, based on the, what's the name of that letter? Damn. What's the name of that letter they got? Uh, I can't remember. There was a letter written in 1917 uh, allowing these Europeans to take the land of Israel as the Jews. The Balfour, Balfour Declaration. Thank you. The Balfour Declaration. That was the letter. <laughs> Let's go on. Let me go back a few seconds. And it's about the rabbinical authority governing the tradition. It is not about the worship of Yah. It has nothing to do with that. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, right? Uh, bingo. I mean, that's it. So you can see, for instance, many modern Jews, self-professed atheists, and their children being taught atheism will nonetheless go to Jerusalem for a bar mitzvah in front of the hotel because it's the tradition. Tradition. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So traditional rabbinicalism would then become the dominant uh, theme of Judaism. So rabbinicalism and Judaism, Talmudism, they're pretty much hand in hand mm -hmm. until you began to see some very radical rabbis uh, start to rise in the 19th century like uh, Victor Mordecai, who would change his name to Karl Marx. Y'all heard of Karl Marx, communist, socialist. Uh, the three lesbians uh, that lead the organization Black Lives Matter base a lot of their movements on Marxism, Karl Marx. He also was an Ashkenazi! <laughs> uh, For instance, radical rabbi, there were other radical rabbis, a guy named Roos, who would be the founder of Zionism, that would be picked up by Theodor Herzl. And then you would see guys coming out of rabbinical uh, leadership that would enter into radical political uh, groups called the Bolsheviks. And uh, so Bolshevism was uh, strictly a Talmudic enterprise Lenin, run Stalin. by radical atheist Talmudists. So you have to understand there's a great uh, film that's available. So they were all Talmudists, he's revealing. Talmudists, based on traditions. Let's go back a second. And uh, so Bolshevism was uh, strictly a Talmudic enterprise run by radical atheist Talmudists. So you have to understand, there's a great uh, film that's available. You can't get it on YouTube, but I think it's available on BitChute, maybe, or Rumble. But it's called Europa. That's Europa, what Max... And it's all in capital letters, Europa. And it gives the history of the Bolshevik Revolution and how brutal was that genocide in Russia. And if you really want to understand the Russian people, until you understand the difficulty of that Bolshevik genocide in Russia, you don't understand them at all. 
fault. You don't, you do not understand Russians. And for the Russians to come back to being an orthodox nation like they are today is absolutely remarkable. This is in the hands of Yah and in the hands of Yah only. It's absolutely remarkable that this would take place. So again, so what we do see is this, is that those who call themselves Jews today have no linkage whatsoever to the house of Yahudah. Rather, they're Greco-Roman. They have no linkage to the house of Yahudah, meaning Judah. They have no links whatsoever to the house of Judah. None, none, none. The question is, how can you prove you're from the tribe of Judah? Well, how do you prove that? How can you prove you're from the tribe of Judah? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Give me Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 2. And let's see, let's see if you match this. Let's see if you match this. Look at Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 2. Judah morning. Judah morning. Wait, you're wait, from wait, the wait, tribe wait, of Judah. Wait, wait. Chapter 14, what verse? Chapter uh, chapter 14 and verse 2. Come on. Judah morning. Come on. And the gates they're of language. And the gates they're of language. Meaning what? The gates are the leadership. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about any gates. It's talking about the actual leadership. They're known as the gates. They're languishing. Read on. They are black. They are what? Black. They are black. Come on. Unto the ground. Black like the ground. My friend, where do you fit in here? Where do you fit in here? I want to hear it again. That this would take place. So again, so what we do see is this, is that those who call themselves Jews today have no linkage whatsoever to the house of Yahudah. Rather, they're Greco-Roman in their, in their racial uh, of origin, not Turkish, Greco-Roman, the Greco-Roman, and they became Jews as a consequence of the practice of the religion beginning in the eighth century. And, you know, and the difficulty with the Talmud is, is that if you believe the Talmud, the Talmud becomes uh, a curse. And it's a very, it's like once you have a Mason in your family, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to break, uh, particularly a 33rd level Mason. Witchcraft. Very difficult to break free from that curse because the Mason eats the soul of the next four generations in front of him. He's talking about sorcery, witchcraft. Dealing with the Talmud brothers and sisters deals with a certain level of sorcery. And that's what he's talking about. All the blessings that would come to his children, his grandchildren, his great grandchildren, he takes unto himself as a mason. Yeah. And uh, and and Talmudism has its own curse as well. And the and so the curse of Talmudism is once you have somebody begin to believe it and to practice it, it brings a curse upon your family that remains for generations. It's a more difficult curse than a mason, than the Masonic order. It's a more difficult curse. Okay. So because of this, now the the Talmud would be practiced by the Sephardim in Spain as well. And they suffered as a result, but they didn't suffer as badly as the Ashkenazim did. Uh, but, you know, the, the Sephardim would be expelled from uh, Spain because mm -hmm. what the scriptures say, if you do these things, I will vomit you out of the land that I have given you. Mm -hmm. And they were vomited out of the land. And that's what happened. And, and they've been repeatedly vomited out of the land where they have gone. They don't see any correlation between their practice and the fact that they get repeatedly vomited out of the land. They're being vomited out of the land right now in the Middle East. Yeah. And yeah. this is and this is something that is that is certain to happen. Now, for those people that do not understand it. So, again, when we talk about Yehuda, now I'm leaving out a portion of this, too, Listen. and I don't want to leave out this portion of it. Because there are many of the tribes of Yasharel that are also present in Africa. Yasharel is how he pronounces the Hebrew way to how he pronounces Israel. He's saying Israel is in Africa. Now, let me, I just want to hear it again. I'll go back a second or two. Again, when we talk about Yehuda, now I'm leaving out a portion of this too, and I don't want to leave out this portion of it. Because there are many of the tribes of Yasharel that are also present in Africa. Right. There is a black tribe of Yahuda in Kenya. There is a black tribe of Levi in Kenya. Levi is Levi. Levi is Levi. Judah. Yehuda is Judah. There is a black tribe of Levi in Zimbabwe and down into uh, so South Africa. The house of Dan is present in Nigeria and in that area. There's right. Yahudim in uh, Ghana and in those areas. And so we cannot leave out. So um, what he's saying there, that I agree at 100%, meaning 
Israel is on the continent of Africa. Some of you here, now y'all big up the continent of Africa. Let me tell y'all something. Our people in the continent of Africa do not have that fire of spirit that is here in America. You're so quick to go, oh, look, the Jews are in Africa. But what about our people here? I'm talking about you YouTube Israelites. You won't even go on the street and wake your brothers up. And if you do wake them up, you make them more docile than you are. And you go, oh, look, the lumber, the lumber. Oh, 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 oh. Let me ask you, what is the lumber going to do? What is, is the lumber doing anything to raise up the tribes of Israel? No. Oh, our people in Nigeria, or the Igbo, they know that they're Jews. Are they doing anything to wake our people up? Huh? No. They walk around with that little kippah on their head, their little yarmulke, and they do this stupid the, the davening thing because they got it from the white man. They got it from the white man. But y'all brothers and sisters here, you won't dare even teach, preach to them that the American black are part of the 12 tribes of Israel, the West Indian black, the Haitian. No, you don't talk about that. Oh, Africa. And you ain't been off your block ever. That was, you, 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 there's some colorful words I got, but I'm going, hmm. But let's go on to hear what Dr. Stephen Pigeon says, because he continues. The black Africans. Now, also, all of the House of Israel, all 12 tribes were present in Libya. Right. In what was called the Carthaginian Empire. That was actually. The Carth Carthaginian Empire's when, uh, dang, what's his name? Ah, uh, good. Ah, Hannibal, Hannibal of the tribe of Asher. You can read about that if you want to know. And um, oh, my mind is going black. From Babylon to Timbuktu, written by Rudolf R. Windsor, he discussed Hannibal of the Carthaginian Empire being of the tribe of Asher. So you can read about that in that book. And I'm pretty sure there's other books. I have some bo other books, but it doesn't list his tribe. Okay, but let's go on. A, the northern tribes of Israel had populated that area before the Assyrian captivity of 722 BC. So you cannot, you can, and probably Moroccans were also probably of the house, the uh, same thing. So you cannot, you cannot kick back and say, oh, gee, we know who the house of Yahuda is. You really don't. We don't. And, and we. We really do know who the house of Yehuda is. We know the American blacks are part of the house of Judah. Now there's other Jews. I'm not saying that only Judah's in North America. That's not what I'm saying. I, the house of David is here. But anyway, there's more Judah scattered out there. We know that, all right, for you simple ones at home. We, we believe, for instance, that the house of Dan is present in Japan. Mm -hmm. The house of Naphtali is present in China and in Southeast Asia and in the Polynesians. Let me go back and hear that again before I make my comment. So probably of the house, the uh, same thing. So you cannot, you cannot kick back and say, oh, gee, we know who the house of Yahuda is. You really don't. We don't. And, and we, we believe, for instance, that the house of Dan is present in Japan. Now he said, we believe the house of Dan is present in Japan. Uh, we do have some brothers on the ground there, and they are seeking and searching for our people. Now, whether they are the House of Dan, I, I don't know, but we'll find out. But this is why the Booster Club is so important. So y'all see the uh, QR code right there? Donate, donate, donate. Or that phone number, text the f to that phone number, okay? Support this truth. Support this ministry. We're the ones going worldwide on a global campaign to seek and find the 12 tribes of Israel. But let's go on. The house of Naphtali is present in China and in Southeast Asia and in the Polynesians. He said the house of Naphtali is in the Polynesians. Around, we were just there. That's around Papua New Guinea, that whole area, the Oceanic Islands or Hebraic Islands over there, which is Hebrew Islands. Uh, and that's the thought that I come across. If you saw the Sabbath class, I didn't mention. I said it's possible that these some of these people in the Oceanic Islands are the tribe of Nathali. That was my thought. And I, and I see that uh, he echoed my sentiments. But let's go on. But the Lord knows, ultimately. The House of Manasseh is present in American Indians. The House of Manasseh, present in American Indians, that's uh, Cuba. 
Okay, that group right there is the tribe of Manessa. Now, I'm not saying that there's no Manessa here in North America. So I, I'll still agree with him on this. I ain't going to fight that. I mean, it goes, you know, and, and the tribes of the tribes of Yehuda is Judah. also present in the American Indian tribes in the St. Lawrence. Now, he said the tribe of Judah is also present in the American Indian tribes. Now, you may have an issue with that, but I'll say this. I do have books that say many American Indians were sold on auction blocks as Negroes. So there's a heavy mix between Negroes and what they call American Indians, because a lot of the original American Indians look like Negroes. Let's go on. Waterway. You yeah. know, the Iroquois speak a form of Hebrew. Okay, right. so I mean, this is some, you know, he said the Iroquois speak a form of Hebrew. There's a book, tag going, my mind just went, boop. Uh, History of the American Indians by James Adair. He goes into the Iroquois language, the Cherokee language. He goes into the Hebrew pronunciation, the Hebrew words. I got the book. So I can also back up with historic facts on what he's saying. But let's go on. Hitler was, you know, and the Nazis, of course, expanded on Margaret Sanger's approach to eugenics, right? Eugen now, this is Steph Stephen Pigeon again, but this was a few years ago. If you notice, his beard is shorter. I'm going to go back a few seconds. I just wanted to bring that out. He opens up with Hitler and Margaret Sanger, who established Planned Parenthood. Let's go back a few seconds. Speak a form of Hebrew. Okay, right. so I mean, this is some, you know, Hitler was, you know, and the Nazis, of course, expanded on Margaret Sanger's approach to eugenics, right? Eugenics was a movement that was born in the United States under hard doctrines of racism with the intent of eliminating the tribe of Judah in, uh, in the African American community in this country, right? To eliminate them. That's why she formed Planned Parenthood, was specifically to kill African American. Uh, you know, black Americans. That's why she did it. Now, her eugenics program, under the concept, under the Darwinian concept, that there was the possibility of an improved seed, which is fundamentally heretical to the creation. So what I want you all to see, he knows the tribe of Judah is the so-called African Americans. Can somebody tell the black woman to pull her, <laughs> pull her head? Out of Margaret Sanger's rectum. She uh, the here's the black. I got my body, my choice. Mer I want to kill my babies. Can Sisters, a lot of you have killed more black children than the Ku Klux Klan. Fact. I don't care if your feelings get hurt. I don't care. I don't give a dag. Oh, brothers, sisters, I pray. That you glean some. Oh, I got. I, I do want to read this about Africa. Since you talk about Africa, Africa, Africa. Where am I going? I'm going to the book of Zephaniah. Bear with me. Bear with me. Bear with me. Let me look. Zephaniah three and ten. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed shall bring mine offering. In that day shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For then will I take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in the pride, in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. Beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, the river of Ethiopia, you have the blue Nile in Ethiopia. Beyond that, you have the regular Nile that goes throughout Egypt, which touches... Uh, Sudan, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, and Zaire. Uh, the Israelites are all around there. Okay, we know that. Uh, what about here in America? Uh, where am I going? Zechariah 2 and 6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north. That's North America. Saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. Yes, we were scattered. But watch this. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Who's the daughter of Babylon? Esau, Edom. Let's go to Psalms 137 in brief. Psalms 137, verse 7 and 8. 
Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. Who? Edom. That's Caucasians. In the day of Jerusalem, who said, race it, race it, meaning destroy it, destroy it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon. See, he's calling Edom the daughter of Babylon. O daughter of Babylon, who ought to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that reward of thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dash of thy little ones against the stones. So the daughter of Babylon is Edom. Back to Zechariah 2. I'm going to read it again. Verse 6. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, North America. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. So it's letting you know that the daughter of Zion, Judah, would dwell with the daughter of Babylon. Zion would dwell with the Edomites. That's North America right here. This is the land of the north that it's talking about. Okay? Brothers, sisters, let's get to the reading of the shout out letters. All right? All right. This first letter reads, Shalom, Most High in Christ, Blessed General Bishop Nathaniel. I'm surprised and overjoyed with all these informative spiritual classes the leadership brings out every day. Fire, fire, fire. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Matthew 9, 37 to 38. This is war. The Feast of Dedication, 12 tribes worldwide. I like that right there. That is so good stuff. That is some good stuff right there. Lord, laugh out loud. Shalom, Carol. Aye, all praises. Thank you, Sister Carol. All praises. This next one is a card. You do so many things for so many people. I'm grateful to be one of them. Thank you. All praise to the Most High. I pray you all are getting those funds. Yes, yes, yes. And you didn't sign your name on the card, but yes, we did get the funds. There was no, there was no uh, name. All right. This next one reads, <clears throat> Shalom, it's been a while since I wrote. Just wanted to say hi. Most high and Christ bless. All praises for this truth and leadership. Shalom, your spiritual daughter, Shaylin B. Thank you, sister Shaylin. All praises. All right. This next one says, Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel, all the other bishops, captains, all the... Uh, brethren on the front, brothers on the front line... Joshua 1.3, Joshua 1.9, my name is Mary, tribe of Levi, include my arms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Mary. All praises. This next one is a card. Thank you very much. Shalom, Bishop, most high in Christ, bless you and all of leadership. Happy Passover, 12 tribes worldwide. Thank you for all, very much, for all you do. From the household of Brother Rico and Sister Carol. Shalom. It's a perfect time to thank you for the nice things that you do and a perfect time to let you know your thought of, your thought the world of too. All praises. All right. This next one reads, Hi, Bishop Nathaniel. You have an impact on so many lives more than you know because of spreading the truth of the true gospel to our people. The 12 tribes of Israel, Negroes, Latinos, Native Americans, even for some of us who cannot attend the school right now, we learn a lot about the Bible just by watching your Sabbath classes and other classes. I really wish I could attend the school in, my, in Mount Vernon, New York, but I can't. It's about two and a half hours away. I live in St. Albans, Queens. I wish there was a school in Manhattan and Queens, but just by watching the Bishop Nathaniel, all the other bishops, captains, and officers, it makes me feel like I am in the classroom. I always pray to the Most High Yahweh to bless you all and keep you alive and healthy. Also, to bless the IUC congregation so more schools can be opened in more places that is needed. If I was rich, I would put my money there for more schools to open all over where we are scattered. But I still will always support all of you with the little that I have as long as the Most High keep me alive. Happy New Year 2024, which comes on a new moon, March 25th, 2024. You are all the true soldiers of Yahweh. May Yahweh continue to bless all of you. Bishops, bishops, deacons, captains, officers, love you all. Mary M. And I see your phone number there. I'll make sure somebody reaches out to you. <clears throat> all right. This next one is a letter. It says, Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel. <clears throat> Thank you for praying for my rib and I. This is for the Booster Club. We are from... 
Belam, Alabama school. Oh, Birmingham, Alabama school. My ribs start disrespecting me because old females in the past would see me and follow me and us when we are together. They would come past by the house. We sat down and had a long talk. So we moved closer to the job. I told them I need to be off as many Saturdays as possible. They agreed one Saturday out the month. <clears throat> now the lady across the street made sure my ribs saw her flirting with me. I do not know this woman. We had a good talk. Now we have peace in the house. Okay. Bishop Nathaniel, I'm 54. I stopped smoking, black and miles, getting my driver's license back, getting my CDL license back. My rib had two businesses. Uh, 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 chose it. And chose to lose weight, lost before I met her. Everybody back out on her that said we was going to help her. All praises, we love y'all. <clears throat> All right. Well, and keep y'all in my prayers. Keep Satan off y'all back. <laughs> All right. This next one says, thank you, Bishop Nathaniel, for the knowledge of the word of God. One of my favorite scriptures is Psalms 119, verse 18. Open thou my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. But you have done just that for me. I ask that you take these arms and use them to help the body in any way. Thank you, Bishop Rico S. Thank you, Brother Rico. All right. This next letter says, Shalom, Bishop. Most High in Christ bless you. We are so grateful that the Most High God is using his prophets to gather his 12 tribes Please pray that my Lord will continue to heal and get strong so that we can get to the Houston school once again. Most I have accepted us by our repentance to the black Messiah and working on being perfect by keeping God's commandments. I pray God's blessing on this arm so that Christ's word will reach his 12 tribes worldwide. I'm so grateful for the IUIC online classes. We have learned so much, i.e. escaping a plantation 2.0, W-O-T-W, fix your face, etc. The captains and deacons be on fire as we study, pray, and apply for perfection. 1 Corinthians 2, 6, Matthew 5, 48, Ephesians 4, 13, etc. Question. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, we believe he rose the word again. Please explain. It means that we believe that Christ did rise. Okay. Let me look at it real quick. Yeah, that simply means he's repeating himself. Okay, that Christ rose again, according to what he was saying. That's all that means. This next letter says, Shalom Bishop and Mother Shamara, most high in Christ, bless you both. Hope this letter finds you two in great health. Here's my small arms toward our land. I'm praying and studying and applying daily and hoping for us to be blessed with our own facility to celebrate all our ho holy days. Hope to send more next time. Tell Deacon Asaph hello for me, please. I'm doing my spa, study, pray, apply when I'm not working and I have learned lots from you and the other bishops, Kanai, Yao Sop, and deacons and captains. Looking forward to meeting you all someday. Take care. I will send more next time. All praise to the Most High God of Israel. Thank you for all you do for our people. Love, Sister Gail. Thank you, Sister Gail. All right, this next letter says, uh, it's from Brother Rob G. of Allendale, South Carolina. It says, Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel, and your household and leadership. We got to always stay strong in the Lord God Most High. Proverbs 7, verse 1 and 2. It's going to get real bad for our people in Babylon if, uh, for Israel, if they don't wake the hell up. They don't really know the true truth that we are the real Jews. They need to read the Bible, praise the Most High. It's really going to get real scary out here for our people in Babylon if they don't repent and keep the commandments. Bless you, Nathaniel. Luke 14, 23, and Genesis 32, 28, 2 Timothy 3, 1. I pray and I pray for my people, Revelation 2, 25. Praise the Most High for you, I see. Most High in Christ. Bless. Thank you, Bishop Nathaniel, for your shout out Tuesdays. I'm sending the brothers of I, I see the men of the prophets and other arms, 12 tribes worldwide, all the way live. Shalom, Bishop Nathaniel. All praises. Thank you, brother. Brother Rob G. All right. This says, Shalom, Most High in Christ, Bless, Bishop and Leadership. It's Mary the Jersey Jew. So, and I'm so happy to continue to support our brothers so they continue to travel. 
I send my prayers and that they reach our people in other countries. Keep up the excellent work. Lord's will, more schools be open. All praises, I send much love, respect, and blessings to you in your household and all the 12 tribes. Lord's will, our people, donate, donate to the Booster Club to be a cheerful giver like me. All praises, shalom, family. Most high in Christ, bless Mary, the Jersey Jew. Amen. Thank you, Mary. All right, this next letter says, Shalom, Bishop. I hope you and the family are doing well. No sign Christ bless the entire congregation of IUIC. It's been a while since I've written you. I was living in Michigan the last time I wrote. I doubt if you would remember me. This was me, frown face. I had a lot going on, but realizing these, uh, er, these were just small trials. I thank the Most High in Christ. I've gotten a lot stronger since then. Anyway, sir, I'm having an issue I need help with. While living in Michigan, I congregated with the Detroit camp. Now, with many, with moving to Charlotte, North Carolina, I was over enthused to know I'd be in the presence of Bishop Yawasak. Only problem is I locate, I problem is I locate the congregation. I know they were in Concord, but I think they moved. No, they didn't move. Can someone send me the same contact, but I'll make sure somebody calls you. All right. They were closed down because of, for a few, I think it was two weeks. Two people had contracted COVID. All right. May the Most High continue to put his spirit on you and the mighty men. Of you, I see to bring out the knowledge of God. Also, could you send up prayers for me? I was recently diagnosed with diabetes. Most high in Christ bless you, sir. P.S. Miss my brother, Deacon Ithan. Well, Deacon Ithan is back. If you've been watching the classes, you know he's back. All oh, praise in regarding diabetes. Uh, if it's the early stages, you can definitely reverse that. Okay? Let's change your diet. All right, I'm going to give a shout out of thanks to Brother Andrew. AI. Shout out of thanks to Carol H. Shout out of thanks to Charles T. D. Shout out of thanks to Shaylin B. Shout out of thanks to I think that says E. Mills, I think. Shout out to Andrew B. I. once again. All right. Shout out of thanks to Mary G. I. of Memphis, Tennessee. Shout out of thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Walker. Shout out of thanks to Leona C. Shout out of thanks to the Brooks Company. Shout out of thanks to Mary M. Shout out of thanks to there's no signature on this one. Shout out of thanks to Lenore, uh, Deborah I. Shout out of thanks to Eliezer I of Raleigh, North Carolina. Shout out of thanks to Sister Lily T. Shout out of thanks to Robin R. D. Shout out of thanks to Warren T. Shout out of thanks to Michelle B. Shout out of thanks to Abram and Sarah I. Shout out of thanks to Sister Tracy M. H. 12 Tribes Worldwide. Shout out of thanks to David. I think that says G. Shout out of thanks to Brother B. Shout out of thanks to hmm, Mr. Why, why, William? Shout out of thanks to Abaya I. Shout out of thanks to Abaya I again. Shout out of thanks to Andre and J S. Shout out of thanks to Darren M. of Maryland. Shout out of thanks to James G. F. Jr. of Homestead. Shout out of thanks to Rico S. Shout out of thanks to. No signatures on this one. Shout out of thanks to Sister Rhonda J. Shout out of thanks to... Uh, no name on this one, no signature. It says Land Fund. Shout out of thanks. Shout out of thanks to Brother Rob G. Shout out of thanks to Danielle R. of Philadelphia. Shout out of thanks to Rose E.D. of Tennessee. Shout out of thanks to Philip E.T. 
Shout out of thanks to Marsha H.S. of Illinois. Shout out of thanks to Gwen R. Gwen R. again. Gwen R. again. All praises. Gwen R. one more time. Shout out of thanks to Keith F. Shout out of thanks to no signatures on this one. Shout out of thanks to Jill L. And last but not least, shout out of thanks to the Jersey Jew. All praises, brothers and sisters. You know how I love to say, let's all of us stay healthy. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay focused. But most of all, let's all of us stay in the spirit. Most high in Christ, bless you all. Love y'all. Shalom. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is children with role models.